We closed our last presentation by looking at the Igorots in Kalinga and how that a new system put in place by its American Lieutenant Governor, Walter Hale, brought unprecedented peace through most of the sub-province. But there was a group of villages in the southeast portion of Kalinga that continued to resist American rule. Hale had attempted to bring the villages that were collectively known as Bakari into the new paradigm of his rule of law, but they would shoot at him and throw spears every time he approached their villages. For Hale, the final straw was when some Bakari warriors beheaded an individual from Lubu, a village that was under Hale's protection. Hale had to demonstrate to all of Kalinga that they could rely on him to exact retribution for its, this murder. It was also at this time, on January 3, 1911, that Hale met with all the Kalinga headmen, and they told him that the Bakari warriors now numbered over 800 and that they had 200 guns and were planning defenses against Hale. So, three days later, Hale typed a letter to Governor Pack, telling him that he was going to take care of the Bakari situation once and for all. He outlined his plan of attack and asked Pack to approve the plan and to order all the other participants to follow his orders. This was the plan. Hale was going to march toward the Bakari area from Lubuagan, and he would be accompanied by Lieutenant Harris of the Philippine Constabulary, along with about 20 fully armed constabulary troops. John Early was going to march toward Bakari from Natunin with Lieutenant Charles Penningroth of the Philippine Constabulary and about 20 fully armed constabulary soldiers. The two groups would provide a pincer attack on Bakari and they were to meet at Bakari at the noon hour of January 14th. Pack approved of this plan and sent a short telegram to Governor General Forbes informing him of it. He then typed out a three-page single-spaced letter to Early outlining every detail of Hale's plan. Pack made it clear who was to be in charge of the entire mission. He wrote that once the two groups linked up, Early was directed to, re to defer to Hale. He wrote, quote, Upon joining Governor Hale and Captain Harris, they will really be the senior officers of the expedition and you will accompany them. You, subject to the direction of Governor Hale, who will assume the responsibility for the civil part of the expedition. End quote. Early following Pack's orders went to Natonin, which is, as we can see on this slide, directly east of the town of Bontok, and he connected with Penningroth. The two men had become close friends over the past year, and Penningroth went on to have a stellar career as a Harvard Law graduate. Hale and Penningroth, accompanied by 20 soldiers, began making their way into Kalinga. As they entered villages, and the people learned that they were on their way to Bakari to make them submit to American rule, scores of warriors got their weapons so that the contingent began to number in the hundreds. The reason for this is that the warriors and their villages had experienced attacks by the Bakari men, and this was going to be their time to exact revenge. Early told them that this was not a war party, and the plan was to sit down with the Bakari people and explain to them the new rule of law in Mountain Province. He ordered the warriors to stay put and not join them. Despite his entreaties, he could tell that they were secretly following his contingent of 20 soldiers. So he stopped and asked all the warriors to come out and join them. The warriors came out thinking that they were going to join the constabulary force, but what Early did was to command 10 of the constabulary soldiers to stay behind and guard the Kalinga men so that they would not follow Early and Penningroth and their 10 remaining soldiers. On the morning of January 14th, Early and his companions began the final climb up to Bakari to rendezvous with Hale and Harris. But as they drew near, Early noticed that the grass was stained with blood 
And as they got closer to the villages, they began to see intestines and more blood on the grass. And then they saw why. Many of the Bakari villages were burned to the ground and all the animals had been disemboweled. A slaughter had taken place. At that moment, early heard men shouting across a mountain, inviting them to cross the valley and join them. It was Hale's men, and they were shouting that Hale wanted them to join them, as according to the plan. But it was not just Hale and his twenty constabulary soldiers shouting at early. Rather, there were over six hundred Kalinga warriors who had accompanied Hale, and they had not come to talk with the Bakari people, they had come to slaughter them. Early refused to join Hale, to which Hale sent a message saying that he was not requesting they join him, he was ordering it. Early still refused. In the following days, Hale's soldiers continued their rampage with some bloody battles. Three hundred more warriors from Lubu and the Kalan joined Harris group so that it now numbered one thousand. After several days, the two groups returned to their homes, early in Penangrath to Bontok and Natonin, while Harris and Hale returned to Lubwagan. They never again had trouble from the remaining survivors of Bakari. This entire incident has been buried in history, and it would have never been brought to light if it had not been for a couple of lines in Penangrath's Bakari report, where he wrote about Hale had brought hundreds of Kalinga warriors and had burnt entire villages and women and men were killed and early refused to join them. Penangras sent this report to his superior, who then sent it to Harry Bandholtz, the chief officer of the Philippine Constabulary in Manila. The message included the following sentence. It may be that higher authorities will consider the means were justified by the results, but until there is some indication of an expression on the subject, I will refuse to furnish escorts to lieutenant governors who take with them hordes of armed warriors for the purpose of devastating the country. This is exactly what Bandholtz was looking for. He had wanted to curb the dictat dictatorial governing method Worcester used with the Igorots. Worcester denigrated the Philippine Constabulary and said that the real authority in the mountain province was his lieutenant governors. So, Bandholtz told Governor General Forbes that the Bakari mission had made it so that his soldiers were not going to support Worcester's men anymore. Forbes told Bandholtz to withdraw judgment until he could get an explanation from Governor Pack. Forbes passed on the documents to Pack, asking for an explanation. Pack responded with a lengthy, blistering report discrediting Penangras' allegations and asserted that his instructions were carried out perfectly by my lieutenant governors. But Pack's assertions were wrong. Early refused to respect the chain of command. Hale allowed close to 1,000 civilians to accompany him, and lawless acts decimated Kalinga villages. Pack also disparaged Penangras' report because it included exaggerations such as the burning down of Bakari houses. Pack wrote, These people have no houses. They are what we would term grass shacks. Plus, it was ridiculous for Penangras to underline this part of the report with a red pencil. At the end of his extensive response, Pack argued that Hale's effective rule included the confiscation of 262 guns from Kalinga villages. The report included Hale's review of the Bakari incident, along with past letters from lowland Filipino officials complaining about the recalcitrant Bakari villages. It became clear to Forbes that he and Worcester would have to travel to Kalinga and investigate the situation. At the time, Worcester was in the United States being investigated by a member of Congress who charged him with amassing a fortune through the buying and selling of land in the Philippines while serving as the Secretary of the Interior. So, 
While waiting for Worcester, Forbes traveled to Lubwagen during the first week of May 1911 and interviewed Hale. Four weeks later, on May 29th, Worcester arrived in Bontok to conduct his own inquiry. He was furious about the situation, and it became evident that his anger was directed toward Early. On Wednesday, May 31st, Worcester traveled from Bontok to Lubwagan to meet with all the sub-provinces' headmen for a large kanyao. It had been four months since the Bakari campaign, and Hale made it clear to the Bakari headmen that they had to show up in Lubwagan to present their side of the story. The Bakari elders traveled to the kanyao, and an unnamed stenographer recorded the interactions. Hale began the conference by addressing the Bakari men in their own language. Quote, I am going to tell the secretary of all the things we have done and the trouble we have had between us. Unquote. Hale described the ugly history between his administration and the recalcitrant Bakari villages, dating back to his initial days in Tabuk when they twice turned back suppliers from reaching American officials. He detailed that he had twice traveled to Bakari, seeking to make peace, but was subsequently shot at and had spears thrown at his party. Hale claimed he had no other choice but to make war on them, and he detailed his destruction of Bakari villages, confessing that he burned their homes and killed men and women. He acknowledged that his men had stolen everything of value from the Bakari villages, and he was ready to return some of their blankets and jars. Also, he returned the jawbone of a beheaded Bakari woman. He ended his speech by saying Worcester would now speak to them, after which they could respond. Worcester began by apologizing for not being the strong man he used to be, so that he himself could not travel to Bakari. He noted that he was aging and had become so important that he didn't have the time he needed to visit Kalinga. But he was unapologi unapologetic about the Bakari massacre. He lectured them with these words. We have had a little trouble with you this last year, and it was your fault. I understand that you said you wanted to have a fight. We don't think very much of fighting. We don't get very much fun out of it but you can always get a fight with us if you want it badly enough. If you insist on having it, if it does you any good. Now, we have just had a little fight. Did it do anyone any good? So far as I can see, it didn't do you any good. You lost some of your houses and things, and it seems that men, women, and children were killed. He warned that the U.S. had cannons that he could bring to Kalinga that could shoot from one mountain to another and... We could bring 10,000 men up here if needed to, to stop the trouble. When he had finished, he invited the Bakari men to speak. The two-sentence response from the Bakari representative was, We are afraid to do any more fighting. We will not fight any more. Worcester's blunt reply characterized his foul mood. All right, we will do all we can to get over the trouble which we have had. These things which we are giving back to you, we do not have to return. We give them back simply to show that we are friendly. You could not take them away from us. We have got them. We could keep them if we wanted to, but we do not want to. When Worcester returned to Bontok, Charles Olson, the treasurer of Mountain Province, and the one friend that Early had on the provincial board, wrote in his diary, Worcester is on the warpath and John Early is in trouble. Worcester was back in Bontok on the evening of June 6, and he fired early three days later. But he was just getting started in developing a written response to the Philippine constabulary complaints about Hale. Finally, on Friday, October 6, 1911, Worcester sat down to type his lengthy report to Forbes, which proved more didactic than informative. He began by defending Hale's actions and reviewed every aspect of the Bakari campaign with the repeated line that the end justified the means. He then asked the governor general whose side he would take, Worcester's or the Philippine constabularies. He wrote, quote, 
are the officers and men of the Philippine Constabulary to be required to cooperate with the governor and the lieutenant governors of the mountain province, or are they to be allowed to carry out the idea that the military must rule or remain ineffective? While defending Hale, Worcester described how the Philippine Constabulary despised his lieutenant governors because the military was so ineffective in Kalinga. He rhetorically asked, now what are the facts? He pointed out that Hale had confiscated more guns in one year from the Kalinga region than the Philippine Constabulary had in Bontok and Kalinga during the previous decade. He then ended the report's introduction with a multi-page condemnation of Penningroth and Early. If anyone deserved reprimand, it was the whistleblower himself. What was Bandholtz doing about his men who refused to take orders from a superior officer? As for Worcester, he had already disciplined his rogue official, ending his report with these harsh words, quote, I need hardly invite your attention to the insubordination subsequently shown by Lieutenant Penningroth, who flatly disobeyed orders from Captain Harris, nor to that displayed by Lieutenant Governor Early, who flatly disobeyed the written orders of Governor Pack and whose resignation from the special government service has since been had at my request. But before we look at what happened to Early after he got fired, uh, we need to look at one other incident that he faced as Lieutenant Governor right after the Bakari massacre. This incident also got him in trouble with the Governor General because Early was trying to protect the Igorots from exploitation. In fact, just three weeks after the Bakari campaign, he found himself in another administrative mess that eventually had local, national, and international repercussions. The problem began with a simple February 3, 1911 letter from a Richard Schneiderwin to Governor General Forbes that included this message. Quote, I am informing, I'm writing to inform you that I am taking 50 Igorots from the mountain province for exhibition purposes in Europe. Schneiderwin also mentioned that this was the third occasion he was taking Igorots to Western fairs. In, in fact, it was his fourth. This instance, however, differed as the destination was Europe and not the United States. Schneiderwin's motive for exhibiting Igorots was financial, and most of the Igorots he previously recruited were from Bontok. But this recruitment trip proved different because early, Bontok's new lieutenant governor determined to stop foreign entrepreneurs from exhibiting igorots as if they were animals or uncivilized. He believed these spectacles denigrated the Highlanders' human dignity, and he had also witnessed how that previous forays of igorot exhibitions proved detrimental to the participants because some had been mistreated, mutilated, and robbed by their American sponsors. Furthermore, many Igorots who returned to Bontok from American fairs found it difficult to reintegrate into village life. But, as mentioned earlier, his primary objection to Schneiderwin's plan was that Igorots were not objects to gawk at, and he would not let Schneiderwin take any Bontok Igorots to Europe. Both Early and Schneiderwin were determined to succeed, and the battle lines were drawn. By 1911, Igorots were familiar with foreign agents who offered adventurous individuals an opportunity to travel across oceans to be displayed for mostly white crowds. The first major Igorot exhibition to the United States took place seven years earlier at the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition, referred to as the St. Louis Fair. The fair provided an opportunity to reinforce Western optimism regarding human progress toward a higher evolutionary development. In many ways, it represented the apex of Western optimism. Modernity continued to push against tradition, and through colonialism, the light of Western civilization encompassed the globe. Still, 
there was work to be done, particularly for America. Having tamed the western frontier, other social engineering projects needed American expertise and exceptionalism. For Republicans in general, and President Roosevelt in particular, the St. Louis Fair was an opportunity to showcase America's Asian colony just two years after the U.S. victory against the independent-minded Filipinos. In St. Louis, the Philippine exhibit encompassed 47 acres and included a wide range of displays from forest products to the exciting prospects of Philippine mining and metallurgy. A Spanish-looking Manila house and Visayan town presented a society heavily influenced by Western civilization. 280 Philippine constabulary soldiers also projected a native population characterized by discipline and training. While celebrating the obvious trappings of civilized Filipinos in these exhibitions, the Philippine Commission, along with leading proponents of American imperialism, had to justify America's continued work and presence in a somewhat sophisticated Asian society. It was Rudyard Kipling's half-devil and half-child Filipino that imperialists wanted to parade before millions in St. Louis. So, the hardcore imperialists brought the head-hunting, dog-eating Igorots down from the mountains across the Pacific to St. Louis. The plan worked to perfection. Truman Hunt, an official in the Philippines, was tasked with bringing the Igorots from Bontoc to St. Louis. He gathered 114 Highlanders and collected artifacts found in a typical Cordillera village. It took 200 cargadores to carry the material to the lowlands where it was loaded onto steamships. The Igorot display was by far the most visit visited Philippine exhibit in the St. Louis World's Fair. It also surpassed all the other exhibits in earning. It cost $8,441 to construct the village, while its gate receipts totaled $200,000. The Eagle Road display presented several challenges for the fair administrators. First, the Igorot men wore their everyday clothing, which consisted of a loincloth. Many were offended by the exposure of the Igorot men's buttocks. Officials ordered Hunt to have the men wear short pants. Eventually, President Roosevelt settled the issue by ordering that the Igorot men take off the pants and wear their loincloths. Dog meat was considered a delicacy among Igorots, and the American public exhibited both fascination and abhorrence for the Igorot's public killing, cooking, and eating of the dogs that were provided to them by officials. The daily routine of preparing a dog for slaughter and then cooking it, along with displays of scantily clothed, spear-throwing Igorot men, provided the sensation that attracted hundreds of thousands a characteristic response to the Igorots is seen in this man's letter to his wife. Quote, I went up to the Philippine village today and saw the wild, barbaric Igorots who eat dogs and are so vicious that they are fenced in and guarded by a special constabulary. They are the lowest type of civilization I ever saw and thirst for blood. Dean Worcester praised Hunt's management of the Philippine Highlanders, writing that, quote, Dr. Hunt thoroughly understands the handling of such people and has furthermore demonstrated his ability and willingness to live up to his agreements relative to proper care and kind treatment of the peoples which he has been allowed to take and which he returns safely to their home, end quote. The Igorots had spent the months of April to November 1904 in St. Louis, and they were now on their way home. Five Igorots did not return home, as they had died from various diseases, including exposure to the cold. Three of the deceased had their brains removed 
and sent to the U.S. National Museum in Washington, D.C. to help anthropologists prove a theory that the less civilized people's brains were different from the modern human brain. As the manager of the Igorot village, Hunt's responsibilities included properly compensating the Igorots based on their signed contracts. But while they were in the United States, he refused to provide the Igorots with their promised wages because he said that he would make full payments once they reached Manila. But when they arrived in Manila, Hunt withheld $4,000, in today's money, about $120,000, and ordered the Igorots be returned to their highland villages. The amount of money that the Igorot exhibit garnered attracted other entrepreneurs to come to the Cordillera and bring out Igorots to be displayed around other places in America. Richard Snyderwin was one of those persons, and in January 1911, he was back for a fourth time to take Igorots out to be exhibited. But this time he was going to take them to France. But when he arrived in Bontoc, Early told him that he was not going to allow any more Bontoc Igorots to be presented as objects in a caged area to be stared at. They were humans and not zoo exhibits. Schneiderwin hired lawyers in Manila who went to the governor general who then sent a telegram to Early saying that he had no right to keep the Igorots from being sent abroad. Early lost the battle, but I'm very afraid to say that he won the war. And this is what happened. Not much is known about the early months of the Igorots at Paris's Magic City Fair, but things quickly turned bad. Schneiderwin was supposed to pay the Igorots $5 a month and for the first time he began following Hunt's pattern of delaying payments, claiming that he had deposited the money in a London bank for safekeeping. He also sought more lucrative opportunities in England, and in 1912 brought the Igorots across the Channel to Brown's Park at Earl's Court in London. But the English public did not flock to see them. Given their country's colonial past, Londoners had already had centuries of exotic, primitive people to gawk at, and the Igorots were just the latest in that long line. So Schneiderwin moved the Igorots to Ghent, Belgium, where they would be part of the 1913 Ghent Exposition. He convinced the tired and wary Igorots that this would be their last fair, and after more than two years in Europe, they would return to Bontoc on October 1913. Unfortunately for Schneiderwin, his seven-month stay in Ghent proved a financial failure. Schneiderwin claimed that the receipts were so paltry that they were barely sufficient to pay the running expenses and food bills, and he had not paid the Igorots for over eight months. They asked him for their payments, but he told them that if they would sign on for two more years, he would pay them. Otherwise, they would have to find their own way back to the Philippines. This broke the agreement they signed in Bontoc, which said that Schneiderwin would pay their way to and from France. Somehow, the Igorots found a way to type a touching letter to the President Wilson. I'll just read a portion of it, but the entire letter is noted in the book, The Governor of the Cordillera. Ghent, Belgium, October 21, 1913. To the President of the United States. Our Father, I, the undersigned, take hereby the liberty, this my writing, to show to the eyes of your right honorable excellency, to inform you the situation and the peril where your subjects are in. We are in the hands of a man who take a liberty with our stupidness because we do not know the law of the white people. President Wilson ordered that Schneiderwin release the Igorots and pay their back wages and pay their way back to the Philippines. Schneiderwin didn't have the money to do either of these things. So the U.S. government took charge of the Igorots and paid their passage back to Bontoc, bringing an end to a story that started with Schneiderwin telling Early he was taking Igorots to Europe. The Igorots returned to Bontoc in early 1914. 
that same year a law was put in place making it illegal to take igorots to foreign fairs. Because early refused to exploit the igorots and massacre them in Bakari, he was unceremoniously fired. He had done much to help the igorots. Not only had he refused to join the Bakari massacre, he stopped the confiscation of land. He stopped illegal alcohol sales. He stopped the porter exploitation, and he tried to protect the Igorots from Schneiderwind. Again, for all of this, he was fired. But as we will see, history has a way of vindicating people, and Early would one day return to the mountain province, and not as a lieutenant governor, but as governor of all the Igorots. But he had 10 years of hard service before that would happen, and we will start with that in our next presentation.